Welcome to our last unit, unit 10 on thermochemistry. And we're gonna kick this off by doing concept one, which is just gonna be an introduction to thermochemistry and what we will be talking about throughout this unit. So kind of to start us off, we're gonna do some discovery stations. I want you to learn about this on your own. A lot of the things in these discovery stations might be familiar to you if you've taken physical science before, especially if you've been in my physical science class before. So I kind of wanted to review some of those rather than just blabbing them at you. And then now we'll kind of dive in. And in class, we're going to go over these discovery stations as we do these notes. But in the video, we're just going to obviously do the notes. So a little overview, what is thermochemistry? It is the study of the transfer of energy as heat that accompanies both chemical and physical changes. If you remember from physical science, energy is just the ability to cause a change to occur. Um, sometimes it's defined as the capacity to do work. And so in thermochemistry, we're specifically looking at the transfer of energy in the form of heat. And we can quantify this, we can measure this using something called a calorimeter, which we'll talk about at the end of the notes. But I just want to remind you here that energy can be in a lot of different forms. It's not always in the form of heat. But in this section of notes, we're really going to be, or in this unit, really, we're really just going to be zooming in and talking about heat. But, you know, there's light energy, there's sound energy, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, just a reminder, a throwback to unit one, chemical and physical changes. Remember, a chemical change is a chemical reaction. We're actually changing the identity of a substance. All chemical changes, so all chemical reactions, involve an overall change in energy. There's some sort of exchange of energy that's going to be happening. And we'll talk all about this in concept two, which is reaction energy. Now, not all physical changes, you know, have a transfer of energy, okay? So a physical change, remember, is we're just changing the physical properties of a substance. We're not actually changing its identity. So if you take a piece of paper and you cut it in half, you've changed the size of it, but you haven't changed its identity as paper. And so there isn't always this transfer of energy in the form of heat when it comes to a physical change. Now, a phase change, a change in the state of matter from solid to liquid or liquid to gas, does involve this transfer of energy as heat. So that's where the physical changes kind of come in. And we'll kind of touch on some things we learned about in our states of matter unit. Um, back in unit seven, we'll kind of bring those back up over the next few slides. So let's talk more about this thermal energy. Thermal energy is the total amount of energy in particles in a sample. So we're looking at all the potential and the kinetic energy of those particles. And it's dependent upon temperature and the number of particles. So just a reminder about temperature. Temperature is a measurement, okay? It's a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a sample of matter. So remember, solids tend to exist at the lowest temperatures and thus they have the lowest amount of kinetic energy, the lowest movement of the particles. Because remember, kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. So if if the Ke is low, the velocity is low. They're not moving very much. So we see that in solids. They're very rigid. They just kind of vibrate. The particles do together. Gases exist at the highest temperatures. They have the most kinetic energy. They're moving the most. And then liquids are somewhere in between. So the higher the temperature, the higher the kinetic energy, the faster the particles are moving and they're going to be colliding more, which we'll talk about again more coming up. We'll kind of review collision theory. Um, the standard unit for temperature is Kelvin, which is a capital K. It's equal to degrees Celsius plus 273.15. We'll kind of in this unit, we'll be using Kelvin. We'll be using Celsius a little bit. You may have to go back and forth. So I just wanted to remind you of that equation there. Okay, let's talk more about thermal energy. Let's, let's really define heat. Heat is rep represented by a lowercase q, and it's the thermal energy that gets transferred from an object of higher temperature to an object of lower temperature. So heat always moves from high to low. I have a picture of a uh, little desk here because you may have noticed when you sat in your desk if it, at the beginning of the day in your first period class that your seat felt cold. 
And as the class period goes on, your seat warms up because heat leaves your body, which is a higher temperature, and it goes into the chair, which is a lower temperature, so that by the end of class, your seat feels warm for the next person who's going to come and sit into it. That's how heat gets transferred from high temp to low temp. And because heat is representative of thermal energy, it tends to be measured in the unit joules. Joules is a unit of energy, um, so it's also a unit of heat because heat is thermal energy transferred. Another unit, though, that we can see for heat is the calorie. And um, this is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. I will give you these conversion factors. Now, this is different from the calories that you see on a nutrition label. So on a nutrition label, we would call those food calories with a capital C, and that's actually equal to one kilocalorie, which is a thousand of these calories. So there's a couple of conversion factors there. Again, you don't need to worry about that because I'm going to give you those in my class. I don't need you to worry about measuring those, but we do need to be aware of them because we're going to be using, just like sometimes we see kilograms and grams, you're going to see joules and calories, and you need to be able to work with both of those and similarly to Kelvin and Celsius. Now I just want to emphasize that heat and temperature are not the same thing. Temperature is a measurement. Heat is an actual like thing. It's an actual thing. Temperature is just a measurement. So adding heat will raise the temperature. Removing heat will lower it but they don't equal the same thing. Um, one last thing I want to mention here too is sometimes you may see something called a thermochemical equation. We use equations to represent chemical reactions, kind of summarize what's happening. And a thermochemical equation, all it does is it includes in your chemical equation that you'd write out the amount of energy that gets released or absorbed as heat. So for example, you know, you could be looking at the reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Those are your reactants. They react to make water. And then you could also see in the product side, you know, plus 480 something kilojoules and that's just telling you how much energy if it's in the products is going to get released if it's in the reactants it's going to be absorbed overall to make the reaction happen we'll talk about this a little bit more in um concept two reaction energy but i just want to bring that up because you may start seeing that if you're looking at textbook or other resources you may start seeing this like number plus some amount in joules or plus some amount in kilojoules or plus some amount in calories. I just want you to know those are thermochemical equations. They're just including the energy transferred in the actual write-up of the chemical equation. Okay, so another value we need to know about is specific heat. Specific heat is a uh, like a known value. It's the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius or Kelvin, depending on the units. So every substance has a specific heat. <laughs> okay, I was going to say a specific, specific heat, but I didn't want to be redundant. So for example, looking at this table, it gives you some example. Like solid lead has a specific heat of 0 0.129 joules per gram times Kelvin. Okay, whereas solid iron is 0 0.449. Notice liquid water is 4.18. Okay, so I, I, I put this in here just for you to see the context. Look at these patterns. Look and see, you know, what requires a higher specific heat versus a lower specific heat. And so these are all different. Now, one thing I want you to be really aware of is these units can change. Okay, this specific heat value can be written as calories, per grams times Kelvin. It could be written as joules per kilogram times Celsius. Like it could be, you can use any derivation of quantities here. Just make sure you're watching your units with your specific heat and keeping an eye on that because that's going to matter as we get into this equation that I want to show you. So we can calculate heat or that thermal energy transfer if we have mass, specific heat, and changes in temperature. And it's with this equation, Q equals MC delta T. So that Q is your heat or your change in thermal energy. You're going to see that measured in joules or calories or food calories. So you got to watch out for that. M stands for mass, which will be in kilograms or grams. C is your specific heat. Um, it's got to be under constant pressure. Sometimes you'll see it as C with a little subscript P to note that like this value is only this value under constant pressure, but I'm just going to do it C to make the equation look a little simpler for you. And this is the one that the units get tricky. 
like I said in the last one, it could be joules per kilogram times Kelvin. It could be joules per grams times Celsius. Like it could be different. What matters is all your other units match up with your specific heat units, okay? I'll kind of point this out as we do examples, but you really, really got to keep an eye on that. And then delta T is your change in temperature. So your final temperature minus your initial temperature. Um, again, so whatever the units are in your specific heat, like if specific heat is given in joules per grams times Kelvin, you need to make sure that your thermal energy is in joules, your mass is in grams, and your temperature is in kelvins, okay? We want to change all of these other things so they align up with our specific heat units. Now, if you do this calculation, you may end up, depending on the temperature, with a positive Q or a negative Q, and that's fine. If Q is positive, all that means is that the system absorbed heat overall. And if it's negative, it means that the heat was released by the system. And we'll talk more about this in concept two. Okay, let's do an example and let's watch the unit so that this will make a little bit more sense for you. Okay, a wooden block has a mass of 20.0 kilograms and a specific heat of 1,700 joules divided by kilograms times degrees Celsius. Find the change in thermal energy of the block as it warms from 15 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what do we know? We know the mass is 20.0 kilograms. We know that the specific heat is 1,700 joules divided by kilograms times degrees Celsius. And we know the initial temperature is 15 degrees Celsius and the final is 25 degrees Celsius. What do we want to know? We want to know Q. And, okay, doing our little radar, let's diagnose what would be the right equation for this. It's going to be my Q equals MC delta T. I'm looking for Q, and that's already on its own. I'll change this so it's a little Q that matches. That was a little typo there. And so we can also rewrite it as this to make it a little easier so you remember that's what delta T stands for. Now, before you do anything else, what I want you to do is I want you to look and make sure your units here match up with your units in your C. Because if they don't, you need to go ahead and do a unit conversion before you start plugging in and, you know, assessing this problem. Okay, so in C, we see that our energy is going to need to be in joules. So whatever our final answer is, it's going to be in joules because that's what the specific heat is in. Our mass needs to be in kilograms. It already is, so we're good there. And our temperature needs to be in Celsius. It already is, so we're good there too. We don't need to do any unit conversions here, okay? Which means we can go ahead and plug in. So Q equals MC delta T. That's M, which is your 20.0, times C, which is your 1700. Delta T is your TF minus TI. We write that 25 minus 15 gives you 10. Now we can just solve, and you get 340,000 joules as your final answer. And again, I knew this was joules because I pulled it from the C units. Okay? Take a few minutes, try these different problems, answer them. You'll have to do a little bit of rearranging. Check your units, make sure you're good there, and then we'll go over those in class. And then we're also just going to do some more practice with these. I just want you to feel really confident using this equation. Again, if you had me in physical science, we've already used this equation, so hopefully it's kind of coming back to you and it's a little bit familiar. Okay, now we just talked about how to calculate a transfer in thermal energy in, in heat, okay, with that Q equals MC delta T equation. There are actually several different ways that we see this transfer of heat happen. There's some different like methodologies, if you will. Now, overall though, heat is always transferred naturally from high temperature objects to low temperature objects. Three ways we kind of see this. One is conduction. That's a transfer of heat through through matter by direct contact of the particles, okay? So the particles are touching and the heat will transfer through the touching particles. We tend to see this occur best in solids because think about those particle diagrams for, that we looked at at the beginning of this. Solids, their particles are the closest together. So it makes it the easiest for them to transfer by conduction. Okay, direct contact could be like you rubbing your hands together, you putting on a coat, you hugging someone. Those are all things that are going to be that direct transfer, okay? Convection is a transfer of heat through the movement of heated particles. We see this here when you're boiling water and how the heat in the water starts to move through the water, okay? This is when, another way of thinking about this is when a warm substance changes location. So think about when warm air rises. I don't know if you've ever been in like a two-story house, you know, 
we're currently renting a two-story house and it's always warmer on the second floor because the heat from the first floor naturally rises up to the second floor. It's that movement of heated particles. And then radiation, you may remember, we mentioned this back in Unit 3 electrons. It's the transfer of heat through the emission of electromagnetic waves. I have a picture here of, you know, a solar panel. It carries energy from sources like the sun and it can capture it there. So that's radiation. So that's just a few of the different ways, again, that we can kind of see that this heat transfer, this Q happens. Now, so we've talked about different ways that thermal energy can be transferred. So that's heat transferred. And, but when energy is transferred, or if it's even converted, because you saw in your discovery stations, you know, heat can be converted, or excuse me, energy can be converted in different forms. It can go from chemical potential to light, or chemical potential to another chemical potential, or gravitational potential to kinetic. It can be transferred. When energy is transferred or converted into another form, it should not be lost in that process. Yes, it can be transferred and converted and transformed into other forms, but it should not be lost according to the law of conservation of energy, which says that energy cannot be created or destroyed when it changes forms. Therefore, the overall amount of energy and an energy conversion should not change, okay? It should be the same. Um, this is also known as the first law of thermodynamics, okay? And so we're going to kind of talk about this Um review kind of this concept with a little fun activity in class. But I have one more thing I want to talk to you about before we close out these notes, and that's calorimetry. I mentioned a calorimeter at the beginning of, um, of these notes. And so a calorimeter is a tool used to measure the energy absorbed or released as heat in a chemical or physical change. And so what it does is it calculates heat lost or gained by finding Q of the water surrounding the reaction chamber. Okay, so this is kind of what like a legit calorimeter would look like. You would have some sort of sample in this sealed reaction chamber. It's sealed so that no energy is getting lost, okay? And we're gonna have the mass of it so we know how much you know, is gets lost. So we're going to burn it. And as it's burned inside this chamber, heat's going to get released. And then that's going to naturally flow from high temp to low temp. It's going to flow into the water and it's going to change the temperature of the water. And if we know how much mass the water has, and we know the specific heat of water, which is a known variable, and we measure its temperature change, which we're doing with a thermometer, we can then know how much heat was absorbed. And according to the law of conservation of energy, all of that heat should have come from here. And so then we can calculate then how much was transferred when this was burned. Okay, and I feel like this sounds more complicated than it is. We're going to do a lab together that's, I think, going to help you really visualize this and see how a calorimeter, a calorimeter can work to help us, you know, quantify these changes of energy and see the law of conservation of energy in action. Okay, and that's our concept one notes.